and you may be seated. And children, four years through sixth grade can be dismissed to go back to room six. KWC Junior, you guys have a great time. Parents, grandparents, you can pick them up in room six after the service. I, I love that song. Maybe some others do as well. But one of the things that I love about that song is victory. I don't know about you, but I like to win. Anybody else like to win? Anybody like to lose? No? In the, the course of, of the years of, of life, I've heard coaches talk about like winning and losing. And they'll talk about things that if you don't want to lose, you need to pay attention to. And, and there are things that that are pretty common, it doesn't matter to the sport, that, that you need to pay attention to. You need to pay attention to the fundamentals. You, you need to focus on what you're doing. You, you need to apply effort. You, you see teams that, that are just kind of going through the motions, those are teams that don't usually have very good success rates, right? They don't really win. All kinds of things that that you got to pay attention to, that you have to do if you don't want to lose. And the same is true outside of sports. In the workplace, if you don't want to lose your job, there are some things that you need to do and some things that you shouldn't do, right? If you don't want to lose a paycheck, get docked pay, there are some things that you need to pay attention to in parenting and with children. There are things that we need to pay attention to, things that we should do and things that we shouldn't do. If you don't want to lose your privileges of being able to stay out a little later, there are some things that are expected, and you need to abide by that, right? Have you learned these things in life? What about spiritually? What are the expectations? What's needed for victory? Sometimes we need like word pictures to help us out to understand the importance of something. Last week, the writer to the Hebrews was talking about the importance and the, the warning them to avoid shipwrecking their faith. And really, that's, that's what we see throughout the book of Hebrews is it's a warning. It's an encouragement. This is what we need to believe. This is the truth of who Jesus is, but a warning to to not stop believing, to, to keep the faith. Here's what we believe, but here's why it's important that we keep believing. It, and sometimes word pictures are, are needed to, to help get a, a warning across, an encouragement across. Back in the day uh, when there was the anti-drug campaigns on television and stuff, uh, D.A.R.E. was out, and, and they had a commercial. Maybe some of you remember the commercial it started with an egg, and like, this is your brain, right? You guys remember that commercial, some of you anyway? And they crack open the egg, and they put it in the skillet. This is your brain on drugs. And then the follow-up, any questions? is like, no, I got it, plain and simple, don't fry my brain, right? I mean, you can, you can take that and understand that, although there were a lot of people that saw that commercial and they chose to continue right along and experiment and become addicted to a variety of drugs that, that fry their brain cells. And the Hebrew writer has something on the line that is more important than even what we do to our brain because it's our very soul. It's our very eternity that the Hebrew writer is focusing on. And wants those that he's writing to, to understand the importance of paying attention and not allowing their faith to be shipwrecked. If you have a Bible, Hebrews chapter three is where we will be looking, what we'll be looking at today. Love for you to turn there. Hebrews chapter three, uh, smartphone or tablet, turn there as well. If you didn't bring a Bible, don't have a smartphone or tablet with a Bible app or a way to, to look at the Bible, grab a Bible from there in front of you. I'd love for you to be able to have it, look at it yourself and follow along and kind of be able to go back 
to verses that I'm going to be referencing later on, things along that line. It's page uh, 847 if you're grabbing one of the Bibles uh, there in front of you. We'll begin with verse 7. Verse 7, the Hebrew writer continues on with the word so. Some translations use the word therefore. Mentioned last week because it starts with a therefore. And as I said before, a lot of times you have to go back to see what the therefore is. Therefore, same with a so. Like they're building on a statement. And it's actually a, a, a combination of statements. An understanding of, of who Christ is. So what our faith actually is, and then why that faith matters. And so we have this so, and it, and it really comes back to, again, chapter 1, understanding that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. That's what's at the core of everything that the Hebrew writer is giving in these 13 chapters. It all comes back to Jesus. So as the Holy Spirit says, and this this isn't just the Hebrew writer trying to give some encouragement, he's quoting God's word. He continues to go back to God's word and, and specifically mentioning the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, is the one speaking, says today, everybody say today, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Don't shipwreck your faith when your hearts become hard. Your faith is in dire danger of shipwreck. Do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Now, he's talking to Hebrews, those that are Jews, shortly after Christ's crucifixion and ascension into heaven, 50 years, 100 years-ish after the fact. He's talking to those that weren't around in the time of rebellion, but they know it's their heritage. They know what he's talking about, as you did in the rebellion, and he's going to continue, and and if there was any confusion, it'll become very clear to everyone pretty soon. But just so that we're all on the same page, he's talking about those that Moses led out of Egypt across the Red Sea, and then they, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years on the way to the promised land. That's who he's talking about. He had already talked about Moses and a little comparison between Jesus and Moses, and now he's going to narrow in on the rebelliousness that took place and how the, the Hebrews, back in the time of Moses, how they shipwrecked their faith. As you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. So for 40 years there was a test. What's the longest test you've ever taken? Can you think of you Taking the ACT and the SAT. I only took the ACT. I didn't want to mess with the SAT. But like, I only need one to get into college, so I heard the ACT was easier, the, a little easier of the two, so I went with the ACT. I'll just tell you right up front. ACT, SAT generally takes about two to three hours. Okay, I won't tell you how long it took me, but generally two to three hours, and that's a long test. And maybe you've taken a longer test, but the, the Israelites, the Hebrews, they had a 40-year test. God is testing them. Will you learn to trust me? Will you learn to obey me? Will you learn who I am? Will you get it? There's a 40-year test going on. Why did it take 40 years? Because they kept flunking. (laughs) They couldn't get it right. And, And the Lord is continually giving them another opportunity. Let's retake that test. Let's keep trying. Let's keep trying. And for 40 years, they're testing him. Parents, have you ever been tested by your children? You know what I'm talking about? I, any of you know that you tested your parents so you and be able to just confess it before others today? How many of you tested your parents? There's at least 
three honest people here today. So, <laughs> How many of you like, I never tested my parents? Did Robin, is that what you said? Okay, now, welcome back. <laughs> you, you have come back from your cruise, and you are in the real world again. For 40 years, there was a test going on. God's testing them. They're testing God. God's patience is being tested. God's faithfulness is being tested. God's character is being tested. Are you who you say you are? And for 40 years, did God pass the test? Day in, day out, God proved himself to be faithful. God provided for them in miraculous ways. He, he took them through the Red Sea. He provided manna. He provided quail. Provided water from a rock. Continually, day after day, morning, noon, and night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for 40 years, God proved himself. God's not just a tell you God. God's a show you God. It says, for 40 years, they saw what I did. For 40 years. For 40 years, the Hebrews had an opportunity front seat, front row to be able to see God be God. And yet, and yet, they failed to test themselves. They did not trust God. They did not obey God. We follow along, verse 10. That is why I was angry with that generation. Who's angry? God's angry. Now, there's a couple of you, a few of you that are new to Kingston, new to Kingston Wesleyan Church. Maybe your first time, second time, maybe like fourth, fifth time. Some have been coming for a while. Some of you may be joining online. Maybe it's your first time. It's not always this heavy. It's not always this alarming. But my task is not to make people feel good. What God has called me to do is to not make people feel good. God has called me to preach his word and to preach all of his word. And so it's important that we understand who God is. Does God love us more than we could ever know? But does God get angry with us? Maybe more than we could ever know. And God was angry with the Israelites. <laughs> Any parent out there have a little bit of trouble with patience with your kids? Like, the Lord, the Lord knows me better than anybody does. And I think that's why the Lord gave me Selah. Because... Sela, bless her heart, is a really, really good girl, has been pretty easy to, to raise. I mean, her mother does a lot of that, but not a lot of rebelliousness and not any of that, because I think the Lord knew I couldn't handle a kid that had much attitude and didn't know how to obey and things like that. Like, not a lot of patience for disobedience. Not a lot of patience for kids that won't do what they're supposed to do and, and mind the parents, right? I think the Lord knew that. Pro knew that I wouldn't be able to spend much time up here because I'd be in prison or something. But for 40 years, God put up with these Hebrews walking them through the wilderness day in, day out, showing them who he is, providing for them, doing miracle after miracle. 
but he's angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. Did they have the opportunity to know him? Absolutely. Absolutely. And they would say at a time... We will follow you. Yes, you will be our God and we will be your people. We are committed to you, you and you alone. We we love you, God. And then they turn around and start worshiping false idols. Have other gods before them. Shipwreck their faith. So... I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. So a full generation of Israelites that had an opportunity to go to the promised land, but forfeited that opportunity because they would not trust God and allow God to be God in their lives. Continue to walk in disobedience. And so the Hebrew writer is writing to modern day Hebrews at that time, pointing back to the past. And this this should be a more a more like in your face illustration than this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. This should drive everything home that the Hebrew writer wants them to understand. Don't let your faith be shipwrecked. Extremely sobering, right? Extremely sobering. He's wanting them to understand you can't live as if you don't know God and then expect Him to treat you as if you do. And that goes right along with what we see in the New Testament and what Jesus said. Huge warning. Verse 12, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you, we could say it, turn it around and think of like anyone. Don't let anyone have a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily as long as it is called Today, there's that word again, today. Everybody say today. That's pretty good. Can you do better than that? I think you can. Everybody say today on the count of three. One, two, three. Today. Today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. See to it that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. This is a warning for all people that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you, again, (laughs) he cares about everybody. Hear the heart. He's warning. Why is he warning them? Because he cares about them. You, you You don't warn people that you don't care about. you don't care about them, like, (laughs) go ahead, hit your head. I'll laugh, right? Go ahead, have a wreck. I don't care. But he's warning them. Why is he warning them? Because he cares. He loves them. Don't let any of you be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. How is sin deceitful? Well, there's a number of ways. Like, it's not that big of a deal. We tell ourselves, "I I can stop anytime I want. It won't cost me that much. I'm still good with God. Sin's deceitfulness. He says, don't let anyone be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. None of you, any one of you. Why? Because it can happen to any one of you. Don't let it happen. Verse 14. We have come to share in Christ. So these things that he's been talking about, what we have in Christ, the hope of 
glory, our sins forgiven, what we have in Christ, that we can call God the Father, Dad, that He's actually our Father, not just our Creator, but that we can have a relationship with Him. These things that we have in Christ, we come to share in them if. Here's the same word that we saw last week. And if you were here last week, I asked, what kind of word is if? Anybody remember? Or maybe you just know? It's, you remember, we went conjunction, junction, what's your function? We went schoolhouse rock on you guys. And conjunction, it, there's an if, and it's a conditional conjunction. Connecting two different thoughts with a condition. So if we hold to our original conviction firmly, which is similar to what we saw last week, and the original conviction that he's talking about is who Jesus is. It comes back to faith in Jesus. That's what basically all of Hebrews is about, faith in Jesus. If you're not holding to faith in Jesus, you don't have the life in Jesus. Jesus has to be Lord. Sharing in Christ requires faith in Christ. So everything that is promised to the believer in Jesus only comes to those that are what? In Jesus. Those that are believing, actively believing in Jesus. So what's the Hebrew writer basically saying? The, the journey may get tough. The journey may be hard. But don't stop believing. Don't stop believing. You may find yourself in a wilderness, but don't stop believing. That's what he wants the Hebrews to understand, and that's what God wants us to understand today. Verse 16, who were they that heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? So think about it, like those that saw the hand of God, that's what he's talking about. Those that that Moses led out of Egypt, they're the ones that saw the hand of God, right? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? So we see rebellion, we see sin, and to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So, conclusion. We see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Connection that I want you to see. Disobedience and unbelief. Disobedience and unbelief. I gave a little bit of a preview to the Sunday school class this morning, the adult Sunday school class. But for those of you that weren't in that class, here's something you may want to write down in your notes disobedience is a symptom of unbelief. Disobedience is a symptom of unbelief. Just as obedience demonstrates faith, de disobedience demonstrates a lack of faith. And so the Hebrew writer is writing and gives a very stern warning to the Hebrews. Here it is in a nutshell. You can't live as if you don't know Jesus and expect for him to treat you as if you do. Sobering, sobering warning. I'm going to read it one more time. You can't live as if you don't know Jesus and expect for him to treat you as if you do. It doesn't mean that God is not patient. It doesn't mean that God is not merciful. It, his mercies are new every morning, Scripture says. It doesn't mean that God is not faithful, even when we are not faithful. It does not mean that God just gives up on us. It certainly doesn't mean that God expects us to always get it right, or else, like God just waiting for us to fail one misstep and game over, go directly to hell, did not pass go, did not collect $200. It does mean, however, 
that God is God, and if we choose to ignore his voice and harden our hearts and turn from him, we can't expect him to welcome us into his kingdom with, well done, my good and faithful servant. Jesus said probably the, the most alarming words that anyone could ever hear. He gave a warning similar to this warning of those that assumed that they were good, assumed that they would be in heaven, and said, the reality is, you're going to stand before me. There are those that will stand before me, and I will say to them, depart from me, for I never knew you. Why? Because you can't live as if you don't know Jesus and expect for him to treat you as if you do. Jesus said, you deny me in front of others, I'll deny you in front of my Father. And here's the thing, we may not deny him with our words, but do we deny him with our actions and our attitudes? Sobering, church, to make sure that we heed this warning. And in that, there are two encouragements that the Hebrew writer gives us in our text for today. The, the first encouragement is check yourself before you wreck yourself. He says, let no one be deceived. And I take that to understand it as anyone can be, de can be deceived. And if anyone can be deceived, I can be deceived. Don't let anyone's heart become hardened. If, if anyone's heart can be hardened, guess what? My heart can become hardened. So check yourself before you wreck yourself. Does that mean I live with what some would say eternal insecurity? Absolutely not. But I also don't want to get into a position where I presume the grace of God when I'm not living as if I know him and his grace. So I need to check myself before I erect myself because if anyone's heart can become hardened, mine can, yours can. And so we need to make sure that we're checking ourselves. The Hebrew writer is writing to those that have placed their faith in Jesus. They've claimed Christ but they're in danger of shipwrecking their faith, turning on Jesus, walking away from the faith, which is that something that we're seeing in today's world? If you pay attention to Christian news, it's all over the place. Pastors, Christian musicians, worship leaders that are called deconstructing. What are they doing? They're saying, I don't believe this anymore. Now, sometimes they're just pulling aside, like, this is what my specific church taught on different things. And there can be good reason to say, let's evaluate things according to Scripture. But the problem is, a lot of them aren't going back to Scripture to examine their life and their faith and what they really believe. And they're walking away basically saying, I don't believe in anything anymore. They've shipwrecked their faith. And the Hebrew writer says, don't let it happen to anyone. So what are some ways that we can check our own heart? And if it's becoming hardened towards the Lord. You might want to write these down. Number one, do I have delayed obedience? In our scripture for today, we see the Holy Spirit says, if the Holy Spirit says today, etc., right? Delayed disobedience says later. I'll do that later. It's kind of like, like dieting or exercise. Like there's some things that we know we should start doing or some things that we should stop doing. And, and like, well, 
after Thanksgiving, any, any of you ever done this before? After Thanksgiving, I'll start exercising or I'll start eating better. Because I, I know like during Thanksgiving time, like pies and everything, and there's really, there no way the diet's going to work. So after Thanksgiving, then I'll start a diet. And then it's like after Christmas. <laughs> after Christmas, I'm going to start a diet. And then it's like after the New Year. After the New Year, that's when I'm going to get serious and, I, and I'll start exercising and I'll, and I'll start eating better a- after the new year. And, and then it's like after Valentine's Day. <laughs> after Valentine's Day, then I'll start exercising, and then, then I'll start eating, right? And, and, then, like, and then we just kind of keep pushing it down the road, right? Same, same happens, doesn't it, with our obedience to the Lord? We know that there's something that God has called us to do. Maybe it's something like sharing him with a coworker or somebody else, and he's, it's clear he's laid it on your heart. The Holy Spirit has said, tell him about Jesus. Tell her about Jesus. After Thanksgiving, then, then after, after Christmas, after New Year, at, is, there just, is there delayed obedience? On the other hand, there's things that you know the Holy Spirit has said, this should not be a part of your life. This is wrong. This is sin. You know it's a sin. It's clear. You're like, okay, I know I need to stop doing that. But I can't right now. Or I'm not going to right now. Is there delayed obedience? Know this. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Scripture says if the Holy Spirit says, Today. Today. Number two, is there unconfessed sin in my life? Is there unconfessed sin in my life? Is there something that I know I haven't taken to the Lord? If I haven't taken this sin to the Lord, it's a pretty good indication that my heart is becoming hardened towards Him. Third one, it Am I allowing sin to be a regular part of my life? Now we're starting to really see a a hardened heart. Am I allowing sin to be a regular part of my life? One final one, and this is different than the rest. Am I choosing to walk in grace daily? Am I choosing to walk in grace daily? daily. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So we have the danger of becoming self-righteous, and our hearts becoming hardened out of self-righteousness. What I have accomplished, how good I am, the things that I don't do and and look at me and aren't I special? And we can become in just as much danger of becoming, of shipwrecking our faith out of self-righteousness, out of living unrighteously. Both can lead to shipwreck. And so I think these are questions, and maybe you can come up with some, no doubt you can come up with even better ones for you yourself to check yourself before you wreck yourself. But the Hebrew writer wasn't just talking about us paying attention to our own heart. The Hebrew writer wants us to pay attention to others. So the second is to do your part to help other hearts. Do your part to help other hearts. Verse 12 and 13, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. And there are different ways that we help other people's hearts physically, right? Like the physical heart. There are some of you, your spouse has some kind of of heart issues, and so they have a a special diet that they need to adhere to. And so you look to do what you can to the best of your ability to to help fix meals and to encourage them to 
to eat right. My wife cares about my physical heart, and so she lovingly reminds me, encourages me to see a doctor every year for a physical checkup to make sure that my, my heart is, is healthy. And will maybe give me a friendly reminder occasionally about my cholesterol or, or something else to make sure that I'm watching after my heart. Why does she do that? Because she wants to keep me around. Why does she want to keep me around? I don't know. <laughs> what are other ways that people do things to help others? Their heart? Well, I, I know the kids at the elementary school participating in Kids Heart Challenge and raising money and awareness and how they can take care of their own heart, but also trying to raise money for those that, that have heart conditions that, that need medical attention and things. There's things that we do physically, but what about spiritually? How do we help take care of each other's hearts spiritually? What can we do? Well, one of the things you think of, like, how do I encourage somebody else spiritually? Well, how has somebody encouraged you spiritually? Because the way that somebody else has encouraged you spiritually is probably a way that you can encourage others spiritually. That might be helpful. If not, here are some other suggestions. Number one, words of affirmation. Somebody has titled it, I see in you. The letters, four letters, I see in you. Kind of like I see you like those that need to go into intensive care, instead of people getting into intensive care before we pay attention to them, how do we help keep them out of intensive care? Well, with I see in you statements, like I see in you, somebody that is growing in Jesus. I see in you somebody that really cares about the elderly. I, I see in you somebody that, that has a heart for others. And I admire that. I, I see in you somebody that's not chasing after the things of the world. And I just want to encourage you. That, that just challenges me. Like, I see in you statements. Looking at others and encouraging them in their walk with Christ. What do you see in others that may, maybe they don't even see in themselves? And you may think it. But oh, what you could do to help encourage them if you would just say it to them. I see in you somebody that has a gift of sharing God's word with children. I see in you somebody that has a gift. Blah, 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 blah. And how encouraging that is for their own faith. Number two, how can we help other people's hearts by sharing your testimony. By sharing your testimony. Here's how I've seen God work in my life. When I hear other people share how God has worked in their life, it's like what, what God has done for you, I, I believe that God can do that for me. Like it, it increases my faith. It gives a boost to my faith when I hear how God has worked in other people's life. But here's the thing. When I tell how God has worked in my life, not only do I trust that that's going to be an encouragement to somebody else, but it's an encouragement to me as well, and it, and it boosts their faith and my faith at the same time. Number three, share your challenges along with your victories. I think one of the ways that we can encourage other people's faith is by helping them to understand areas where ours has been lacking where ours has needed help, whether it's in the past or even in real time. Because one of the things that our enemy, enemy likes to do is make people feel like they're the only one. I'm the only one that has this struggle. I'm the only one that has these doubts. One of the best ways to overcome struggles and to overcome doubts is not by pretending that they're not there. It's by voicing them so that they can be addressed. 
And one of the ways that we can help encourage the faith in others, and it may seem counterintuitive, but is by sharing our own challenges, our own failures, our own need for God's continued grace in our life. So share your victories. Share how God has worked, but also share your challenges. Share your shortcomings. Because sin's deceitfulness will say, it's just you, you big loser. And we need one another to know we're not in this alone. Number four, lovingly challenge areas where there is clear sin. And somebody said, well, isn't that judgmental? Like calling out other people's sin? It's only judgmental if the heart behind it isn't a heart of love. If you're only calling out somebody else's sin to make yourself feel better, if that's the only reason why you're doing it, then don't do it. But just like my wife encourages me to make sure that my cholesterol is okay, why does she do that? Because she wants to keep me around? Because she, she loves me? If I really love somebody, I probably should be warning them when I see sin overtaking their life. When I see them struggling in, in sin. And, and it's not to come along and kick them while they're down, but to say, make sure, one, that they understand that it is a sin, but two, to know that they have somebody that's there to walk with them, to help them, to encourage them to not continue in that path. We need to be that for other people. So understand this. It's not judgmental to point out sin if your motive is love. It's not judgmental. It's love. So do your part. Do your part to help other hearts. Heavy message today. Heavy message. Clear warning to avoid shipwrecking our faith. And I certainly hope that we see the wisdom in checking ourselves before we wreck ourselves. I hope we see the wisdom in looking to help other hearts, to doing our part to help other hearts. But I hope we also see God's heart when he calls us to do both of these. That God cares about us. Cares about our faith. Cares about our relationship with him. And one of the things that I think the enemy would love, like almost nothing more than to turn a, a loving warning to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves, I think the, the enemy would love to turn that into just a condemning message. A, a message of fear. A, a message of, there's no hope for me. I've wrecked myself. And there may be somebody here today or listening online and you're thinking, I, I'm too far gone God's given me too many chances. Talk about 40 years. Like, he's given me 70 years, 80 years. Maybe you're like, not, it hasn't been 70 years or 80 years. But it's clear God, God has been extremely patient with me. And I just keep messing up and messing up and, and messing up. And, and I, I'm too far gone. I've, I've wrecked myself. Here's the, here's the good news. The word for today is today. Today, if you hear his voice, guess what? It's not too late. Today, if you hear his voice, it's not too late. Today, if you hear his voice, respond to that voice. That voice that calls to say, believe me, put your faith in me, respond today. Tomorrow might be too late. We're never promised 
were never promised another breath. And I don't say that to scare anybody into faith, but I do want you to understand the reality. So today, if you hear his voice, reply, respond, submit, surrender, obey. If you hear his voice, it's not too late. Today is the day. And so, Father, as we sit and soak in a, in a really heavy word today from your word, may we truly reflect on what it means to believe in you, to have faith, and to understand that we can't separate belief and obedience. We can't separate faith and sin. So Lord, help us to be faithful to you as you have been faithful to us. Help us to trust you with all that we have. Help us to submit and to surrender to you with everything that we have. And Father, today, if there's somebody that maybe for the first time, they're recognizing your voice, saying today is the day of salvation. Today is the day for you to receive forgiveness for your sins and enter into a relationship with me. Father, I pray that they would respond to that. That they would confess their sins, just acknowledge that they are a sinner before a holy God. And that there's nothing they could do to earn your love and there's nothing that they could do to earn salvation and eternity with you that you have loved them before the creation of the world and that you have died for their sins, paid the price for their debt, and they simply need to turn to you, receive that gift of grace, acknowledge you as Lord. And so, Father, if there'd be anybody today, may they do that now. And for many of us, may we reflect on that time when we did turn to you, and may we reconsider and re-up that commitment today and make sure that our faith is solid in you, that we hold on to that confession that we made at the beginning. So, Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for today. May we build our lives on your love, your grace, and the truth of your word. I pray this in and for your name. Amen.